Welcome, good morning, and thank you very much to those of you who are here this morning. After uh, the, the heavy networking yesterday evening, with the drinking and dancing and so on, and thank you very much to the organizers for the, for the wonderful dinner yesterday, including under singing as well, so, so thank you very much for, for yesterday. So welcome this morning. Actually, you made a good decision getting up in the morning and foregoing the nice sun to be here today. I think we have perhaps, I'm a bit biased, but one of the most exciting sort of sessions uh, in this conference, digital platforms. What is the impact of the digital platforms on the impact, the impact on the health system? How do digital platforms make the health system more accessible, more affordable, more efficient? And I'll add two more objectives myself, if you, if you allow me, to improve the health outcomes and, as been said at Nauseum, how digital platforms empower the citizen. We all agree digital platforms have great potential. Digital platforms are in all the horizon scanning exercises. Digital platforms will save the day. The question, of course, is what is a digital platform? Digital platform is just that software and hardware. So a digital platform is all about data and big data. Data that will support uh, the health systems, will support the strategies of the health systems. But there is a, a, a wide array of terms under this concept that the organizers are putting for us under this broad term. term. So there's big data, this e-health, m-health, telehealth, personalized medicine, and a wide range of uses, diagnostic, treatment, management, evaluation, and so on and so forth. So I will rely very much on our speakers today to give us very practical examples of what you can do with digital platforms, what you can do with big data. I did some research myself, and you know what big data is? Big data is a band, it's a music band. And you know what's the best single of this music band called Big Data? The best single is Dangerous. So Big Data, Dangerous. And you know, Anders, I, I wanted to sing like you, but I won't dare it. You know what the lyrics of Dangerous say? Well, the other side of it. How they know they have been listening, they have been waiting, they're under my bed, they're outside, they're looking at me. That's what Big Data Dangerous says. I don't know as a premonition of the kind of debate we're going to have today, but uh, there you are. Uh, so, more seriously, what I like to hear, what I like to do in this uh, hour and a half, which we start a bit later, still an hour and 25 minutes, what I like to do is start with the first round from our speakers. We're very lucky about these speakers because we have really the four key actors, organizations we would like to have. Missing perhaps one others, the patients. But I know the patients will be terribly, terribly uh, straightforward and will contribute a lot on the ensuing debate. But we're very lucky to have, we start over there, the industry, Elizabeth Kuyper, uh, Director uh, of European Affairs at FPIA, uh, one of the organizations that is hosting us today. So we have the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, for which big data uh, holds a great promise as uh, for everybody else, but particularly for the industry in following the impact of new pharmaceuticals, of new medicaments, the health outcomes. We have as well the academia. Academia always saying that there's not enough data, they want to do more mining, they want to know what's going on. So we have the academia represented here by Zoltan Kahlo, professor of health economics. Uh, then we have as well the two big organizations. We have the European Commission uh, in charge of pushing uh, some of the strategies, assessing what member states are doing. Petri Silgavis is the head of the, of the unit of health and well-being and DigiConnect. He's as well the regulator to some extent. They're looking at issues to regulate the quality, data protection and so on. And we have the OECD represented as well at the very high level with Mark Pearson, uh, Deputy Director of Employment, uh, Social Affairs and Labor uh, at the OECD also an organization that has been looking and assessing and comparing trends across their countries. So indeed, we have a very good selection of people here to talk about the issue. So as I said, the first round of questions in which I'll involve you immediately is, 
Let's hear about what do we do with platforms. How do these platforms really support our strategies? How do they support the affordability, the efficiency, the empowerment, the access? Like other devices of technologies, digital platforms should be submitted as well to health technology assessment. We should evaluate it. If I were, if I were devil's advocate, I would say sometimes some of these digital platforms seem to be a solution in the search of a problem rather than a solution trying to address a problem. So let's be very rigorous as well with the kinds of strategies that we see. So we'll start first, as I said, asking them, perhaps I should start uh, with the academia. Huh? Uh, Zoltan, give us a sense, uh, no, actually I'll start with the European Commission. Let me start with the Commission. The Commission actually was very impressed. Yeah, I'll let you start. I'll leave you at then, I'll leave you at then. <laughs> We were discussing with Mark whether he's going to be your facilitator, whether it's better to be very well organized <laughs> or improvise. So we both like to improvise. <laughs> Not by design, but by default, right? <laughs> Petris, uh, I was very impressed, actually, the way that uh, you had many initiatives, but particularly the, the Green Paper in M-Health. I really enjoyed the, the Green Paper, uh, in addition to put some of the strategies forward, puts together quite a lot of interesting evidence about the impact of, of all this of all this sector, particularly of course on the apps, how this sector, how does how does this market look like? Why can what's the kind of impact we expect for this developing market uh, on our health systems? I mean, I think the potential is very great. I mean, starting with a few words on the big picture. Uh, the idea is through the empowered patient, through the prevention agenda, to both d deliver better access to health care and to make our health care systems more sustainable. And then obviously as well with a trustworthy apps economy to also create growth and jobs. If we go down a level, we can look at the apps in probably three different categories. One, which would be in the area of public sector innovation. So for the healthcare systems, which is obviously their choice under the system of subsidiarity, but to deliver services, whether this is e-prescription, whether these are appointments, whether these are uh, programs to be followed directly to the citizens. Obviously, we want to try to support this and work with uh, examples of best practice in the member states on this. Secondly, there's the area of social innovations patients, groups, consumers, groups, others getting together and communicating and sharing data that they want to, again, utilizing the apps and the mHealth possibilities. These are areas where people are able to live the way they want to and use the technologies to do what they want. When talking about this, we can never forget about the digital health literacy and also concern for the vulnerable groups because not everyone is online, so we have to go with digital to where the citizens are, not expect them all to come to us. And then finally, there's the commercial sector, which I think is a, a great ally. It's not at all our goal to commercialize health. Health is a fundamental lot right in the European Union, and this is the way that we work in this context. But with the sector of the apps being developed, especially for fitness, for a lot of areas, calories, sleep, etc., which could very much feed into people being able to live healthier lives, there is a great potential that if these apps are trustworthy, are secure, and these are the barriers that we have to overcome, the public sector, both at the European and national level, along with, how to say, our partners, the other stakeholders, then the data can be, depending on the choice of those who are compiling the electronic health records, be an added asset obviously saying where the data is coming from, that it's coming from an app, not from a medical exam. It can be an asset in moving towards personalized health care. Mm -hmm. uh, you had some numbers in the green paper, I think 97,000 apps, uh, or did, did I dream this, this number? Or I, I think in fact, a large number. it depends how you define health and well-being apps, but I think the number is up to 120,000 now, but you see that the uptake of them is not so high, and in the responses to our M Health Green Paper, the main barriers or the first barriers that were cited were trust and security, which is why I think in follow-up questions I'll answer a little bit what we're trying to do with our partners, the stakeholders, to address that. Mm. 
Uh, we'll come back to the issues of security and quality in more detail, of course. That's one of the issues that uh, we have some concerns here in the room. But going back to this 120,000, just grew to 120,000, uh, how many of those have been used as well by the health service, as well by the individuals? We don't know that in detail, but is that happening? And uh, are all of them sort of uh, empowering? Are all of them increasing efficiencies? Uh, do we have any numbers of that, or is it too early? Well, I do. I mean, you, you have, which, I mean, I don't know at this exact moment, but you have an exact number that are regulated as medical devices because they have to go through the appropriate certification procedure. So you know that. Those are the medical ones that are either connected to a medical device or are mm -hmm. basically delivering exactly. medical services. Then you have the rest. And one of the issues and one of the reasons why we don't foresee any kind of heavy regulation in this area, it's, it's moving very fast. I mean, you see the statistic that apps in general lose half of their users in three months. This isn't just M Health and well-being apps. So the number of people using an app from the time that it goes out, even it's popular, to three months later to later can change and change drastically. I mean, this is a part of... I say also public sector, it's public sector and social innovation, but the commercial part, it's a market that is evolving rapidly. So we also have to regulate, and I use regulate the word in uh, the wide sense, we have to address this area in a way that doesn't hamper the growth of the technology of people being able to gain benefits, but that does address any negative impacts that could arise. Perfect. Thank you very much. As I said, we'll go back to, to how we ensure that there's no negative impact of all these apps. Zoltan, I will bestow now on you the, the control. I have another one, just in case you go too long. Um, <laughs> Zoltan will be telling us about the utilization of big data, of uh, digital platforms to support research, and to support research, to support evidence gathering research to support the health systems, to make them more efficient in perhaps more resource constrained countries in Central Eastern Europe. So if you want to, to start with that. Yeah, and, and actually uh, at uh, uh, our university we have a, a two year master program in uh, health economics and health policy and then uh, I, I was teaching uh, mainly economic modeling before but I understood now that uh, how important it is to do health uh, policy research and, and uh, dealing with, with uh, the problems of uh, access, uh, uh, I, I realized that, that how important it is, is uh, to think about uh, uh, why uh, Central Eastern European uh, health systems are not as efficient as, as others uh, beyond, of course, uh, the limitations in, in the resources. So, uh, um, in, in, in uh, my opinion, uh, there are two problems uh, with, with uh, uh, decisions, especially in the, in the field of healthcare financing, is that uh, we don't uh, do uh, ex ante evaluation of, of uh, how we spend uh, resources, and then uh, there is limited political interest uh, in, in monitoring uh, uh, decisions. And, and, and uh, uh, as, as a consequence, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, you can see the, 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 the uh, yellow-green uh, area, which would be the necessary uh, public health care budget uh, based on needs. Uh, and then uh, the way uh, we spend this budget is, is the uh, uh, pinkish, uh, reddish uh, uh, area. Uh, so we uh, spend uh, some money on things that we shouldn't, uh, and, and then uh, some of the uh, uh, budget is, is uh, spent uh, well. But the problem is that uh, uh, we need to have uh, the sustainability of the healthcare system, and that's why in these systems uh, we implement uh, volume limits, uh, volume limits on everything. Uh, and, and delay access of patients, and then uh, as, as a consequence, uh, even if uh, the technology is good, uh, uh, looks good value for money, in our healthcare systems, uh, the uh, uh, benefit from those health uh, uh, technologies are not as great as, as expected uh, before. So uh, just an example, uh, in, in Hungary there is a huge debate uh, that uh, uh, although the spending on uh, new oncology drugs was tripled, uh, we don't see improvement in mortality. And, and this is a question whether 
uh, it's a problem of the drugs or it's the problem of uh, patient routes blocked by many uh, restrictions. And, and but we don't know. And if we don't know, we cannot have interventions uh, uh, to, to tackle uh, uh, this uh, uh, situation. So, so uh, obviously, uh, one of my other uh, research interests is differential pricing, which I strongly believe that uh, uh, should be uh, implemented in, in Europe. Uh, but but uh, a better use of uh, big data uh, can uh, give us uh, the diagnosis on, 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 on what is the problem with, with our uh, healthcare systems and where to intervene uh, in order to allocate our scarce resources more uh, efficiently. And then, then we have to uh, make better use of, of uh, payers' databases, uh, patient registries, and, and uh, in my opinion, also information uh, from uh, patients. So patient-reported outcomes are, are equally Im uh, important. So we need to improve on, on, on using uh, this, this existing uh, data. I don't think that this requires a huge investment, because I'm, I'm talking about use of existing data, or better use of existing data. Maybe PROs, uh, uh, you need a little bit more investment, but, but uh, uh, really uh, it's about uh, how we can uh, get better information from existing sources and then uh, implement policy uh, recommendations accordingly. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that this big data will help you to have a, have a better, better understanding on the impact of health outcomes because the current ex-ante HTA is really sometimes doesn't take place the way you expect it. So you need more data on health outcomes. Uh, you need it as well for managing performance and for resource allocation. The case of cancer is really interesting. So you're saying that the, the, the budget on drugs is on drugs and other technologies as well? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's another technology also, or? radiotherapy. And, and so I, I'm talking about high-tech technologies and, and Hungary made a huge investment into this field. And, and currently there is a huge public debate. Why don't we see uh, the impact uh, on, on, on those patient segments where we, where we uh, invested a lot. Uh, obviously, we need to go more de uh, uh, deeper into the uh, data, uh, but, but uh, uh, currently a lot of uh, people are disappointed with, with the outcomes uh, that we get uh, from uh, this uh, huge investment, but we don't know why we don't get the outcomes. That's the problem. Could it be because the, these drugs are not reaching the right patients? Is it because we waste them in an appropriate patients? Or Not because the right patients, because of volume controls, never go? Right patients meaning those who can most benefit from the treatment, they never get it? Or what, what, what's your yeah. thesis or hypothesis there? One, one, of, one of the potential explanations can be that they are not uh, used at the right uh, time uh, for the right patient. Uh, and and uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I think uh, we have to solve this uh, uh, problem because currently uh, uh, many, um, uh, let's say, uh, financial decision makers uh, believe that uh, uh, this is uh, the bad example of, of how uh, uh, much is the return on investment uh, into health. So, so we have a common interest uh, here to explain that, that uh, uh, well, uh, if we make an investment, uh, then, then uh, we generate uh, health. Uh, and then uh, I think, in my personal opinion, the problem is with the patient roots and not with the technologies. So we need to uh, uh, evaluate uh, what is the problem with the current uh, patient roots, why patients don't get the benefit what they can get in clinical trials. Very useful. It's very interesting as well as an academic. I think it's one of the first academics I hear that is not asking for more data. So you are saying you want to have access to the current data. You think that if you could access the data of the payers, the data of the providers, you'd be happy. Yeah, I would be happier, much happier already. <laughs> so you're not asking for more of it? <laughs> not significantly more. I, uh, the existing data sources, to be honest, uh, in, in many countries, uh, uh, we have a public uh, uh, funded healthcare system so, uh, in which we can uh, link uh, potentially patient records with individual uh, IDs in an anonymized way. And we have uh, uh, cancer registries and things like this. So potentially, if we link, can link uh, this data with this fantastic data source uh, for research. And you know, we shouldn't do research just for doing research. Uh, but, but, but if we don't uh, have the research, how to understand uh, what is the problem in our system? And we cannot uh, uh, design interventions if we don't have the diagnosis. Excellent. Thank you very much. You talked as well about differential pricing and payment for performance and using data 
to try to allocate resources <coughs> to pay according to the effectiveness of treatments, which actually links very much to, to Elizabeth and to the FPA and to the whole issue about price differentiation for pharmaceuticals and so on. But the question to you, Elizabeth, today is, of course, big data, as I said earlier, holds a great potential for the industry and for those of us who are interested, of course, to see the impact on the health outcomes, to monitor the side effects on pharmaceuticals, to learn about more and new utilization for some pharmaceuticals. So can you give us a sense, and then we'll pass the control to you, it's over there. <laughs> can you Thank give you. us a sense of the, of the kinds of uses, practical uses of this big data to know better about health outcomes, about impact of treatments and so on? Yes, of course, I would be glad to do that. And especially since I'm very happy actually with your introduction by saying that we need to use the already existing data. And especially since yesterday, we've already been discussing the fact that we should make the shift from the focus on volume and transactions to better outcomes. I think that also our generic colleagues yesterday have really been showing that in a very comprehensive matter. And since Vilnius was all about action, and since we wanted to have this session in a very practical way, I indeed, in this first round, would prefer to show you a new initiative FPI is working on at the moment, so that perhaps later on in the questions, also with the public, we can discuss on how to best use that. Because today, I would like to give you an example of our new initiative under the umbrella of IMI, the Innovative Medicine Initiative. And I guess all of you already know this initiative, so I just introduce it by saying that this is the, the flagship uh, funded by the European Commission and by FPI. And our news initiative is Big Data for Better Outcomes. And what I have in mind in order to give you a very concrete idea what that means for a specific disease area, because as you can see, it's really uh, the shift from outcomes um, to sustainable healthcare systems. And I wanted to give you the example today of Alzheimer's diseases. Because it is really to address the current unmet needs in Alzheimer's disease, and in particular, the lack of integrated data standards. Because there's still a lot of lack of consensus around the appropriate study designs and endpoint in real-world data sets. There's still a lack of clarity on how to best model the natural history of the disease in using the real-world data sources. And you can see there the different uh, stages of, of the disease and the um, study. So the end goal of, of this ROADS project, what, that's the name uh, for this initiative on Alzheimer's disease, is really the improved assessment and the treatments of Alzheimer's disease patients. It's to build an understanding on how to measure the outcomes in Alzheimer's disease, and it's in collaboration with the health authorities, the health technology assessment bodies, the regulatory agencies, the provider, of course the patients, I think we should have mentioned them in the first place of course, and it's to define a data strategy plan for a second phase in 2019 to really collect real-world outcomes. And as you can see, just to sum up what it's all about, the expected impact of roads of this initiative is better patient care from the early stages of the disease. Because we all know it's really started at a very early stage, even when you're not yet uh, tracing it in practice. So it's really about a better understanding of the evolution of the disease and the data to enable giving the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. It's better data from early stages of the disease, earlier diagnosis, and better selection treatment from the start. And of course also, because that's also one of the important goals of the initiative, faster access to innovation. And I think that's what we're going to discuss later on, how indeed with the projects we're working on, how indeed we can have faster access to innovation, because that's what it should be finally about. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing that <coughs> for other diseases, of course, for the, the client groups, or disease groups, as well as uh, uh, Alzheimer, right? So you have several experiences on using this big data for monitoring the evolution of other uh, disease groups, right? Yes, exactly. It's really about different uh, disease areas. But this uh, disease, this example of Alzheimer's disease was really to give you a specific example about a specific initiative within the, the initiative on, on better outcomes for uh, big data for better outcomes. That's exactly what we want. We want to hear more of these practical uses. 
you still are at the beginning of these processes, no? You're still putting design in the system and so on. Have you been able to collect some of the data already or we're still at the beginning of the process? Yeah, we're really still at the beginning of the process because uh, only two weeks ago in Luxembourg we, we launched this initiative. So we're really now early stage. So we're collecting input from who's working and who's uh, subscribing uh, for this initiative. Thanks, thanks very much. In a minute I'll, I'll ask you to come in to add new examples, to ask questions about these particular illustrations. But before that, I'd ask to ask, ask, like to ask Mark, the, the OECD has been collecting and analyzing lots of these developments across their member states, their countries. So Mark, could you give us a sense, the control to you now, <laughs> about the kinds of initiatives, the ones that hold promise, the users, and perhaps the users as well yes. of some of the big data? Thanks, Josep. Yes, I, I mean, actually, you said something in the beginning, in your introduction, which I agreed with. And you noticed there you the are, finally. You noticed the surprise <laughs> about a decade, and finally, there's something we're agreeing on. Brilliant. Um, Great day today. <laughs> <laughs> you said that um, a lot of talk about big data has been almost of the form of a solution looking for a problem. And I think you know, a lot of us have spent many years going to conferences, hearing about the potential of big data, and it has to some extent been a technology-driven process, and it hasn't had enough health involvement, if I can put it like that. I mean, the, the focus on the outcomes has been much less important in many of the discussions than actually setting up the data platform, if I can put it like that. I think finally, however, we are seeing some genuinely positive out outcomes from use of big data. And generally, a lot of this big data that I'm going to be talking about, these examples, are really from electronic health records. So that's not using the electronic health records for the immediate purposes of treating the patient, but then matching them over time and using them for a, a secondary purpose. I've divided them there into four different categories, um, but you can cut these things in many different ways, of course. Uh, I mean, the first one is almost the obvious one. It's better clinical decision-making. And some of the examples there, KP is Kaiser Permanente. Uh, it always intrigues me whether Kaiser Permanente really is that much better than everybody else or whether it's just better at publishing its <laughs> results. But whatever, Marketing. there's certainly a large number of results from Kaiser which show better clinical decision-making. I've put a couple in there. This risk stratification for sepsis, reduced antibiotic use, uh, for um, premature births by half. That's based on a sample of about 600,000 cases. The uh, adherence of therapies on colon cancer, that's predicting who won't follow future therapies and therefore treating them dis differently in the early stages. So this is not about follow-up care so much as how you treat them in the initial stage. Increased five-year survival rates from 65% to 75%. Uh, the FDA is, that's a well-known one. I mean, this looking at drug interactions uh, got about, I think there's 380 million years, person years worth of data in the, the FDA database now to pick up uh, unwanted drug, drug interactions. They're the obvious things that I think most people would expect to see use of big data. To some extent, I find the next two almost more interesting in the sense that they're trying to do something a little bit more different about the governance of the health system and waste reduction. Uh, there's uh, groups centered around the Carolinas in, in the US which tries to predict readmission risk um, and has a, a database of 5 million patients, really um, impressive uh, impact on trying to reduce readmissions. Khalid in Israel is trying to do something the same. So elderly patients who go into emergency room, um, uh, they try and predict likelihood of readmission using big data analyses, and then have nurses, nurse-led interventions once they go outside of the emergency room targeted on who's identified using the big data. They've reduced readmissions by 5%. That doesn't sound like a huge amount, but of course, it certainly pays for itself uh, big time. CMS in the US, the, uh, the payment body monitors, as you can see, 4.5 million transactions a day. I mean, that's seriously big data, just picking up fraudulent claims, $115 million per year. Uh, and then finally, I mean, this is picking up on what, what Elizabeth was talking about. I, there's a few examples where research is actually already showing some 
outcomes from using big data. But I think generally we're sort of in the stage that Elizabeth's talking about. It's putting together the various consortia in order to be able to use big data for research. Uh, and you know, I've highlighted there, you know, the UK has this system of pooling 22 data sets together in order to get a reasonable amount of data, particularly for dementias. And now they're pooling across the Atlantic with Canada and more generally within Europe. I think we're getting really quite large data sets there for dementia, and that's very promising. And I've also have to mention that the IBM initiative, um, it's not just them of course, but they're um, putting a huge amount of effort into this cognitive computing. So this is, again, just using the big data to come up with, with um, algorithms which then can support um, uh, physicians when they're dealing with, in this case, chronic heart, heart failure, supposedly basically getting about 13% more effectiveness in predicting oh. chronic heart failure. So it's, it's really using, you know, like these computers that do the chess play the chess games, um, and they're, um, they're coming up with something too. So I think there's quite a lot of positive examples. Of course, we are also now getting negative examples. There are some out there. Um, uh, emergency rooms in the UK, an attempt to, again, do risk management in the emergency rooms. Actually, it's only a partial failure because it did improve quality of care, but it certainly didn't save money, and a, a, a more a bigger failure, which was more unfortunate, looking at childhood obesity and children at risk of diabetes, which unfortunately didn't work in the UK. But that's what you'd hope for. I mean, yeah. we don't expect that everything, every use of big data will work. I think what we slightly, you know, in the last basically couple of years, maybe even less, maybe the year, we, we're moving to the stage of big data being almost a normal uh, way of looking at evidence for health systems whereas in the past it was fantasy world to some extent. That said, we are still miles away from using its potential, uh, and I'm sure that will be what we'll get onto in the follow-up discussion. We will, we will. That's absolutely perfect, Mark, because this is exactly what we're talking about, the four major uses of having big data. And I think it's been excellent. Thank you very much to all of you, because you've been so to put in very particular examples on the areas where we have more issues with outcomes and in the areas we have more potentials for efficiency. The dementia, the cancer, the various areas that admissions, readmissions, one of the key areas, uh, coronary heart disease, transactions. So I think that's a perfect slide to go back to you now and to you colleagues to get more examples. And the title is perfect, Mark, actually. Big data for what? So big data for what? Up to you. If you could go around with the microphones, because I'm sure I knew you'll be the first, Boris, and John is going to be the second, right? Because yesterday, <laughs> every coffee break, you told me how wonderful big data you have and how wonderful things you could do. I want to hear now in public to say the same things, okay? <laughs> first, yes, Boris. <coughs> Boris Azai is from MSD. Um, uh, first, a small comment. Uh, Peter, as you mentioned that uh, the, you know, after three months, people using uh, health uh, applications uh, drop off. 50% um, stop using those ap applications. Actually, for drugs, for chronic disease, we're not that far in, in effect. You know, for, for asymptomatic uh, uh, disease such as you know diabetes, to some extent, after six months, it's 50% of the people who stop using their drugs. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I would want to challenge something on you know the big data and the the, the great horizon and so forth, because in a sense. Uh, isn't that, and it's a great thing, a, a, a way to finally use data, basically, data that is here. Because big data is, is something really, um, you know, with a lot of uh, technical different streams and so forth. But we've, we see hospitals now basically looking at their high cost patients, and you can do that on a spreadsheet and say, oh, maybe there's something we could do about, you know, Mr. Smith there, who cost us a fortune while well, he missed his appointment. So maybe we dedicate a nurse to make sure that he comes to the, the appointment. We send a taxi and so forth. You, you, you have examples of that uh, reported in, in the, the media. So that's not really big data. It's more like evidence-based clinical care. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating when you, yeah. you look around. So rather than looking at the technology that's going to solve everything, 
basic Six Sigma steps or you know, uh, management basically uh, can go a long way. Um, I, I wanted to have, you know, ask a question, not necessarily on big data, but on digital platform and on telemedicine. I think one thing that, uh, that we're struggling with, because my company is offering uh, services on telemedicine in a number of markets, but the challenge is the, the payment, basically, is that how do you monetize a, a service? And so how do you move from pilots in this hospital and there, et cetera. You have, we have evidence, clinical trials, randomized clinical trials showing the impact on uh, readmi readmi uh, readmission. But as long as member states or you know, healthcare systems pay physicians for face-to-face -face visit, well, they will want to organize their day around face-to-face -face visits, no matter what is mm -hmm. good for the patient or not. Thanks. I'd like to go back to that uh, later on. That's, that's key. Once you have the big data, once we know that is uh, the efficacy in a lab, in HTA sort of uh, lab, so to speak, how effective is within the health system. And that doesn't depend on the big data, on the gadgets, on the technologies, on the devices. That depends on the incentives, depends on the culture, depends on the organization, on the regulation, on many aspects that I like to spend a fair amount discussing because I believe that the industry working on that actually doesn't worry so much about the research about the, about the implementation of big data within health systems. I want to spend some time on that. But Boris, you were saying that actually these apps are not very useful for, for adherence. I mean, the, the, the industry is worrying about that as well. I mean, adherence of treatment. So you're saying that uh, with or without apps, people will stop taking the treatment. Yeah, I don't think it's been really measured, uh, or not to, to my knowledge, basically, whether apps can uh, increase adherence. But there's a lot of attempts. That's for sure. I mean, we have something that we did with the uh, Diabetes Patient Association in, in France that was designed by patients. It's called uh, Diabeto Partner. And so it's, it's an app, but the, re the reality is that, and we talked about it uh, some time ago, uh, apps are probably mostly downloaded by healthy people. <laughs> if you're really sick and you have multimorbidity, um, and you're 72, ah, you know, it's, it's really the human interaction and there, you know, the skill set, who is, you know, the, who is mandated to talk to the patient in a medical way and so forth and so on. So, uh, so probably you need to integrate much more of those into, into the health system, into the healthcare providers and so on. That's a very good point, actually. John, you wanted to say something? Just I'm hinting you should say something or... Yes, well, Thank you. Um, John Weber, a posing, and we have the ICT that's not here right now, so yeah. I will have a little bit to, uh, to explain a little bit that the ICT is much further as we are sitting here. So, no, you're not right. We have, um, we have apps, and we know that they are not working. So, and the reason why they are not working is like with the gaming. If you're doing gaming and you come to the next level and the level is too easy, you stop playing. So what they're looking in is into the gaming aspect for health apps so that we are getting actually the adequate information to get forward. So then you get to pe keep the people interested and then it goes on. So there is quite a lot of work to Delft is working on that one, for example. Um, no, you're not right. It is paid. Last uh, month, uh, the United States started to pay for telemedicine. Yeah. So that's the uh, first thing. Yeah. We, yes, we have now two uh, countries that are starting to think about that one as well. So there are things that are going much faster as the, let's say, a neutral way. No, we are going positive forward. Um, about big data, um, the word big data is a little bit of a blub. So please start talking about qualitative data in a high quality, in a high quantity, because otherwise we just have rubbish in, rubbish out, as, as the ICT guys are saying. Um, about what is on the M apps so important? Well, it's not important uh, as uh, was said from the Commission. It's not important what, what is in it as long as it's not threatening for the people because we have anyhow people that are making apps. You cannot stop that one. What's more important is that they are assuming that they are measuring something, then this measurement should actually be considered. So the sensors that are actually measuring should actually measure what they are saying. And at that moment, that is probably where we need a little bit of uh, legislation, that it's not an assumption what's coming out. 
about data that you are collecting. Yes, we have a lot of data. Because the, um, one of our members, MetWeb, is actually working on the blue button in the United States Army. So they have all over the world, they have a backbone that is interconnected to all hospital information systems because when a veteran falls out somewhere in the world, they need to get that data to that point. So that is in a way solved. The problem is that if we are going, before it was said here, like let's look into the data that we have right now. That is an illusion. It will never happen, not today, not in 1,000 years. The reason, no, well, in 1,000 years it will happen it because happens. we have a standard and we have interoperability everywhere with standards. So then we can use the data actually from one side to the other because they are using the same standards. Right now, inside of a hospital, we have different departments using different systems. So it will never happen that we are going to get the data from one side to the other just because it's not possible to have from one system to the other. We're working with DJ Continua on the, on the um, interconnectivity and standardization when that's there. Collecting data, yes, we have a PET used by the United States Army. Why? Because if you put people in Ebola environments, you want to monitor them. And from that, so that um, technology, we're using right now in Europe two test cases in uh, the EU regions but we're putting that on chronic disease patients, it are plus minus one million people. The tests are right now running, but they are with interoperability and they can be shuffled between all different stakeholders. But then we need to talk about who's going to do the governance on the data, who's actually allowed to look into it. And last thing, but not the, the less important, as a policy, we are now going to be from 1st of July, we are going to do the governance on really big data. That's the biobanks from the BBMRI, ERIC uh, biobank with 14 member states working on the D DNA, the biobanks. And that's really big data. So we had to think about big data and how to do interoperability about two years ago. So maybe we should put a little bit more ICT people here to give more explanation about the word big data, because the, the word big data is much more known, knowledge by the ICT people, as by others. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we don't talk about big data, we talk about high quality, high quantity data. And uh, you say that you have half a million records in your, in your database. So lots of issues, Petri, is around the issues of interoperability and lots of uh, and issues about regulation, about uh, platforms of exchange and so on, that we'll talk in a minute. But more points, Adrian, more points yeah. about the use of big data, high quality, high quantity data. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Professor Callow. So yesterday, Richard uh, explained that he just negotiated a groundbreaking agreement here in Latvia to uh, have a performance-related, health outcomes-related deal, payment, eventually, with the Latvian government. But Zoltan, what you related uh, to the situation in Hungary is that the industry, whether it was the medical device industry or the medicines industry, delivered the product, which presumably has been demonstrated to be effective, but for maybe non-product related reasons, it wasn't effective. So in the case of performance or health outcome related pay, who would be responsible for the failure? Would it be, uh, for instance, Richard's the members or the members of the uh, medical uh, technology industry? Would it be the healthcare system? You see, because if we evolve in this direction and it doesn't work, there's going to be a lot of squabbling back and forth over who's going to get paid or not. Uh, or maybe the patients did something wrong. Maybe the patients are going to have to pay back the money to the healthcare system. You see, there are a lot of issues around this in if we are evolving, which I think we probably will evolve towards this outcomes related pay. Or will it be the expectation that the industry will go in and fix the whole healthcare system to make sure it works because some of these technologies are new and complex to implement? You know, who's going to be responsible for what in an mm. outcomes-related system to deliver? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll always blame the pharmaceutical industry, of course. I mean, it's always <laughs> your fault. But uh, in addition to that, actually, your question is central here, is when we use big data for performance or analysis, uh, per when we analyze, assess performance, the issue of accountability needs to be there. We need to tie those objectives to a particular actor that can make a difference on this performance. And many of the performance assessment mechanisms, it's very difficult to attribute accountability. But Andrew, you had some word, please. Uh, 
Uh, just to, to, to continue a little bit on John's point uh, that, uh, you know, how to make that uh, workable for the number of analysis across continent. You know, we, we have seen uh, one of the study <coughs> a few weeks ago when we discussed health system performance assessment. Yes. The researchers, they spent, you know, 40% of uh, grant money to, to make uh, data uh, comparable, you know. So, so, so we, we, <laughs> we, we, uh, Mark, you mentioned uh, waste, uh, you know, we are wasting money because we, we are not able to make data comparable when we start. So we try to do, you know, some, some work, you know, we, for example, patients register guidelines that they use, so we like, but there are many issues around the semantic, you know, between departments, but between countries, you know, it's simply not possible to do this this, this easy. So it's the, the, the first point. But, but really, I, I, I would like to maybe go back to Elizabeth's um, uh, presentation, you know, the, 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 the tricky idea also in, in IMI, you know, I'm a member of the board of IMI, and, and, and is also a way to bring data from industry, academia, and health systems together. So this is also an interesting question, yes. maybe, Elizabeth, you can develop this a little bit more, because the why industry, why academia, why governments, you know, would like to pull data together and get the result? Because this is, this is, I think, we already have seen in the schizophrenia um, uh, project that, that this pulling data from all resources, it's very, very, it's bring great research uh, uh, outcomes. So, so how to do it and what are the barriers? That would be my question to, to, to Elizabeth. And the question to the panel, because you started from the, fears around this this big data debate and I would like to also go back to your first question because it's a it is an issue you know we are now coming to the trialogue of the debate about data protection in 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 in, in the European Union legislation I was in the US uh, last week when the new initiatives around the uh, precise medicine initiatives and building a cohort of 1 million Americans the main problem most probably will be not technical problem, but the legality of the of this yes. exercise, and, and if Americans decide to to allow, you know, used medical records, you know, what are the conditions? What is the issue around, for example, the uh, life insurance companies having access to our data? Uh, this is what you what you will hear in this public debate. You know, the employers having <coughs> access to our data. We have the famous yeah. crash of the German wings. Uh, uh, plane yes, in, in Alps and, and, and the big question, you know, the call from, from, from a French prosecutor, why employer was not getting access to the data of the, of the, of the pilot who, who crashed. So, so where are those fears and how, to, how we can cross them? Because without this, you know, without uh, public kind of understanding of this exercise, but also legal, framework, we'd be not able to, to roll this, this, this exercise. Perfect. I, I have to continue here. I'll come back to you after. No, I want to have a very short point from Richard because that's for the word. And then I'll come back to you. Don't worry. Because in a minute, I want to move, I want to move on to the issues of data protection and safety and quality. Richard, your last very short point. Well, it's actually it's a question. It's a long I point. I think there's some very rich uh, comments here, though, I must say. It's a very, very good things to be discussing. I have a question to Peter. Is uh, it's a little bit what you talked about, John, the quality of the, of the, of, of the data. As you meet these ICT and app people all the time, I have a question about you know, the quality of what's going on, particularly the sensors, because I've read user reviews for the new Apple Watch, and people are complaining, saying the heart rate monitor is not working. And, and apparently, also according to the press, the number of features in these new sensors which have not yet been launched because they're not approved by the FDA. Right? So here comes the question of, you t talked about, people need to trust it and they need to be secure, but it's also that it needs to work, right? As I mean, so for medicines, we have the European Medicines Agency and it's all controlled. So what are the right um, balances to make sure that the new sensors as they come and the apps are actually correct so that we can use, so we can use the data for whatever we want to use it and the patients can use it for what they want to use it for. So what, what's, what do the app people say about the standards, the FDA, is the technology there, and how, how far away are we from really having all these things that are also appropriately uh, um, giving Perfect. data? Perfect. Thank you very much. So let's do the following thing. I'll come back to you after this round. Uh, I'll start with Elizabeth and then Zoltan, uh, well, because there are some questions for you, some reflections, and then I'll go to, to Petris and Mark, because surprise, surprise, you have perfect slides ready to address many of these questions. We're very organized. So we'll hear about issues of quality, issues of safety and regulation. But first, Elizabeth and Zoltan. Yeah, 
Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. Okay. Elizabeth. Thank you, yes. Yeah, because I would be happy indeed to take Andrew's question and also then I think touching on Adrian's question. Because it's, it's actually interesting. I think last night we had a discussion that if you take a step back on a lot of discussion we had yesterday about outcomes and really the need to focus on outcomes, that if as an outsider, if you're not so much as all of us in, in, in this world and into this language, you're wondering, yeah, but why are we talking about outcomes? Isn't it logic that if a doctor subscribes in something that it's supposed to work and now all of a sudden we present it as a shift and apparently it's very special that we're now going to measure how it's going to work. Isn't it what it's supposed to do? So I think that's an interesting observation because it's all about the way our health systems are organized. They're organized with a focus on volume and transactions and not yet on actually what's working and what's not working. And we, as, let's say, specialists in this world, we might know that it's, it's not always the case. But therefore, it's so important to, to start uh, with really a focus on outcomes and how it's working in, in practice. Because I'm involved in a lot of discussions about pricing and then the accessibility and affordability of healthcare system in Brussels. And you, you hear that people really start getting that change, that, that it's needed. But actually, we still need the data and also really the evidence on how it might work and indeed uh, also touching on, on questions like the, the one Adrian raised, in case indeed we know how it's going to work in practice, indeed working together with healthcare uh, subscribers, with patients, with payers and all stakeholders involved, how is responsibility re evolving then? Because we also know that in our systems they're still basically organized in silos. We really have the healthcare silo, we have the social security systems, and in that respect it's also hard to really take a broader approach. And I think this initiative we just launched is really aimed on, on having this longer term vision in order to be able to also shape our analysis of, of how healthcare systems should work at the longer term. Thank you. Excellent. Zoltan, you want to reflect a bit on this? Yeah, uh, let me just uh, tell you one observation which is uh, about uh, the examples that, that uh, were presented here. Uh, I don't know whether you realize that uh, all examples are from high income countries on uh, the, the, the best use of, of big data. And the same applies for HTA. You know, uh, those countries use HTA and big data who's got money to waste, and those countries who have less money to waste uh, don't do that. And, and actually, this is a, a very important uh, issue because if we would like to reduce uh, 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 the, the uh, inequity, uh, then we have to improve this uh, situation. Uh, and, and, and that was uh, my uh, uh, initial uh, uh, point. Uh, I think, uh, let me just uh, uh, react uh, uh, to some uh, uh, questions. Linking uh, a different system is not possible. It is possible and we can make a huge improvement. Uh, the best case, uh, for example, is uh, linking uh, uh, UNOS, SRTR and Medicare records in transplantation because actually the major breakthrough publications in transplantation are from uh, linkage of, of uh, uh, different existing data sets and then we learn how to manage patient uh, through these uh, big studies so it's a fantastic improvement for this uh, uh, special patient group uh, and then we would like to see it uh, in, in, in many uh, other uh, therapeutic areas. Uh, about apps, um, uh, actually um, I think if, if uh, uh, we have a notion not just uh, to use something but to achieve uh, an objective that can be part of it so for example if uh, uh, we um, uh, make uh, um, uh, uh, pay for performance uh, uh, in, in hospitals uh, and then one of the ways of improving performance is to use apps then then, then most probably even uh, physicians may have uh, incentives uh, uh, to use techniques that are currently not that interesting uh, uh, for them and this is also my answer somewhat uh, to uh, Adrian because um, actually uh, I, I truly believe that that we should have an attitude of of monitoring uh, a decision not just selling drugs but but you know improving uh, outcomes and 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 that's 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 the reason why we need to understand whether eventually improved patient access can be uh, linked uh, with, with improved uh, health outcomes and we should create financial incentives as pilots I, I, I 
I don't say that, that we should do it in all area, but we should, we should create a tradition for that. And you can do it with hospitals, you can have uh, pay for performance systems in certain areas with hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and by the way, with patients, uh, for example, that if uh, a patient uh, gets access uh, to uh, the most uh, uh, expensive diabetes medication, but eventually uh, the hemoglobin A1C is, is not at target, the patient has to step back. That's the deal. And so the patient is part of, of his own uh, outcome, so we can, we can uh, think about uh, having these kind of uh, concepts of, of paying for uh, 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 performance. So I, I think it's really about uh, uh, moving uh, to a better standards. I agree that, that it won't be fully implemented. Uh, databases will never be fully linked, uh, but we, we just have to move to this direction and then, then create really a, 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 a tradition and notion uh, towards outcomes and not just access. Perfect, thank you. Patrice, I, I think your, your reflections are very timely mm. now about the issues of quality, the issues of regulation, the issues of linkage. So we, perhaps you can integrate some of the questions. Many of the questions went to you and to your presentation as well. well. Thank you very much. I get to control the slides now too, which is also, also good. Well, first answering briefly on, on the apps. This was a statistic on all apps, not just the M Health and Wellbeing apps. And I would underline there are two situations here, which also relates then further into Richard's question. First of all, where the app is not doing what you think it should, or it's leaking your data, or in other ways is unsatisfactory, and then people don't use it anymore and probably shouldn't. The second situation is where the app is achieving perhaps behavioral change, which is wished for, and you have a problem of adherence, just as the way you have for medications. So this is something that, again, we have to work in a multidisciplinary way with stakeholders, with others, and see how these beneficial cases can be better utilized. And now moving to the question, which we think is absolutely essential about the quality and in a wider sense, uh, in following up on the M Health Green Paper, it was underlined in comments of the stakeholders that the main problems that were posing barriers to the rollout of M Health were privacy, security, quality, reliability, reliability, and transparency. So we're following a three pronged approach encompassing all the stakeholders all together in trying to address these issues. The first is a code of conduct on privacy and security, which is being prepared by what you could broadly say the M Health industry and the apps developers, which has two main goals. One is to add as act as kind of a guideline for the apps developers. This is what you have to do on privacy and security, which is in the European legislation. And secondly, as being a sort of promise to those who would use these apps that these developers are in line with what the code of conduct says with the legislation and in simple wording. This is something being facilitated by the commission but we're not writing it and the industry will be consulting with all other stakeholders and already is and will be submitting this to the article 29 working parties, sorry for the lingo, these are the data protection authorities of all the member states who are observers in this group. So there we cover the area of privacy and security, as I say, coming a little bit bottom up from the industry and the other stakeholders themselves, facilitated by the commission. Importantly now on the quality and reliability of the M Health and Wellbeing apps, and now I could say everyone is invited who can get to Brussels. On the 6th of July, we're having a stakeholder meeting to move into the next step on this. A possibility among others, and this is still to be discussed there, the, how to say, question is on the table, is work on guidelines on which apps are providing reliable and valid data which could be then included in electronic health records. So without in any way trying to make great barriers to entry in the market and try to certify and follow up on 120,000 apps, there could be at least guidelines in the European level which could be implemented in M member states or by specific uh, disease associations, others on areas like diabetes, respiratory diseases, et cetera, what constitutes a valid data set in these contexts where 
how to say, the healthcare system could use afterwards. Other questions will be on the table and this will be discussed. And further linking to this, um, Richard brought up the question of the sensors. The sensors are actually in consumer products liability, safety, and contracts legislation as tangible products covered. A little bit what we're doing, and I'm coming from DG Connect, from the digital single market people, um, we have to bring the old offline legislation online. And in a future-proofed context, this is why we're coming up with this rather florid title of a pro-innovation regulatory framework for non-embedded software. These are basically the apps and, at the moment, um, software models for 3D printers. Why we use this non-embedded software, we're trying to be future-proofed. We don't know if apps will be, how to say, the software of the future that will be used. There might be something else. But you see in a lot of the consumer product safety or liability or contracts legislation right now, if the app or the software model is not connected to a tangible product, a sensor, a phone, sold with it, sold or authorized with a car, sold or authorized with the light bulb, etc., it doesn't seem to be covered. So with this, without making any new barriers to entry, this is a pro-innovation approach, um, we are trying to make sure that where the thing doesn't work, the consumer, and I'm talking consumer now because there's a question perhaps somebody's paid personally, um, they can get their money back if there have been damages because the measurements are completely inaccurate. Again, there is a way to do it, and the thing would be possible to take it off the market, to take it off the Android store or the, or the iTunes store. So basically, in the three-pronged approach, we're addressing the industry, all the stakeholders, as I say uh, in the second group, uh, patients, doctors, everyone is welcome and as well to give inputs to the industry on the first. And then finally, you get the important group, us, the, the lawyers and the, and the commission, but actually working with the, with the member states and the parliamentarians. And I was joking about us being an important group. Um, Joseph, do you want me to show the, the other slides? Okay, so I'll just go through these quickly so as not to, to dominate. Um, there are other um, things that we're doing also as part of the follow-up. We will be ensuring uh, facilitation of the deployment of mHealth through research actions on digital health literacy. Again, we see this as very important, not just working with the early adopters, but with the whole population. Big data, in our case, big data for public health. So again, making sure that the big data potential is being used for the state-run healthcare and specifically even further for public health. Uh, digital security, we should not, by introducing mHealth and by putting the power in the hands of the patient, make the whole system less secure. We have to look in a holistic way at the data uh, digital security. Evidence gathering and exchange of best practices. Further, interoperability was brought up. We'll be possibly extending the European interoperability framework to uh, cover M Health here. Inputs from the stakeholders are still welcome. And the main goal is citizen-centric healthcare, uh, patient empowerment, digital health literacy, access to the health data, obviously with proper concern for data protection, and the result would be co-production of health. Beautiful and the e-health action plan, EHRs, telemedicine, which was mentioned, citizen-generated health data, big data, trust and security. These are perfect. Every, everything off. <laughs> Bring it back now. I don't want to kill it. Uh, we, can, we can leave the e-health action plan on the screen. That's, that's excellent. So 5th of July, everybody to Brussels, uh, first thing. Uh, Six. Let's, Six. Six, six, six of July, the middle of the holidays. Well, Good time. Good. <laughs> not, not yet my holidays. Actually, they're not my holidays either. Many of us are not having holidays in July. So, lots of emphasis, Patrice, on self-regulation. Lots of emphasis on, on, on carrots as well as sticks. And uh, regulation pro-entrepreneurship, pro-competition, pro-innovation. Because we tend to think of regulation always as restricting, but I think very good examples of regulation pro-entrepreneurship, pro-innovation. There'll be lots of points, I'm sure, in a minute. As well as Andres and Kaisa for the, uh, from the European Patient Forum, I'd like to hear later on about how you feel all these data, these apps, are empowering our patients, are empowering us. But before that, uh, I'll go back, and I'd like to hear, because there have been lots of questions, Mark, around issues of linkage, 
implementing uh, all these databases uh, and so on. If you want to hold the show this slide, it's fine. Just put it in case. I can, I can hold it. You can hold Thank it. Thank you. That's kind. Not for long. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> well, actually, no, I'm going to go back. Uh, you, yeah, you've deleted the other sh charts, no, have you? Oh, uh, I, that is light, but that is light was... Um, nah, that's no, all right. It wasn't, I'll, I'll it wasn't that censorship, one. really. It was censorship. <laughs> I'll blame you for it. No, I just wanted to start with something Boris said, which is actually important, when he talked about the fact that um, we often don't use the data that's around. I mean, those of you at the beginning may have seen I have this strange title, because I also cover not just health, I oversee OECD's work on migration, on social policies, on employment policies as well. And I think it is a very striking thing that health generates more data, the system generates more data, and when it actually comes to the governance of the system, it's the part of the government that least uses data. I mean, the number of decisions get made by health ministries that don't use data, and I'm not talking about big data now especially, I mean, just data. An awful lot of decisions are made based on expert opinion rather than data, or indeed simply the prejudices of the current health minister or powerful stakeholders. And I think that's very, very striking. The chart that has been deleted by Josep, I'm sure uh, he is censoring me, was just looking... I thought it was a typo, actually. <laughs> was, ...was looking at, at how uh, electronic health uh, record data is being used and is being planned to be used across a sample of about 22 countries. And it's very striking that only half of them are talking about using the data for public health monitoring. So these are countries which have some sort of electronic health records, but only half of them are talking about using it for, for monitoring public health. Only a quarter for supporting dis physician treatment decisions and health system performance monitoring. A bit more than that, looking at research and patient safety monitoring. Uh, only four countries out of the 22 currently allowing electronic health records to be used in a reasonably general way for facilitating and contributing to clinical trials. So it is a classic case. All this data is out there, and yet we're not using it anywhere near to its potential. So this isn't a question about collecting new data. I don't think health... Well, there's a couple of areas where I wouldn't mind some more data. But generally, we do have a huge amount of data in health systems. We simply don't use it, for it uh, up to its potential. And for sure, part of that is down to a lack of imagination, lack of resources, lack of an understanding. I think a lot of it is also because actually electronic health records on their own, or indeed most of the data sources we have in health on their own, aren't actually going to give you that many insights. And what we generally need to do, and this is the purpose of this chart, is that we need to link data sets together. Zoltan already mentioned this. Uh, the problem that we have with linking uh, data sets together is, first of all, to be able to do it, you're going to need some way of matching the data. So you're going to need some um, um, ID. I mean, so what this chart shows there is the green bars is showing, is the data available in all these different areas? Is there some sort of data available at the national level? The red bar is how many of these have a unique identification number, which in principle could allow you to link. And the blue bar is showing, does it actually happen on a regular basis, that there is linkage of that data set to another data set. This is looking at 22 countries. There is a bias towards high-income countries. So this is weak on um, Central, Eastern European countries, just to be clear. Um, and what you can see there is what, what you'd expect, I suppose, that whilst there is, in many cases, a lot of data being collected, often we don't have unique IDs, so even the potential of linking the data together, so we can't look at inpatient data with, say, primary care data in order to be able to, to check whether we have a full care pathway being looked at there. Um, but when you actually get down to actual usage, we're on tiny numbers in, um, in some of these different data sources that we have. I mean, long-term care, I think, for example, we have about two or three countries there that actually regularly, regularly link the data that they have to any other data source in the health system. So not surprising, I suppose, that that's an area where the, the failure to coordinate care is so apparent and the, the waste and the poor quality of care comes through. For, for what it's worth, um, if you look at the countries which do best at, at linking 
data. I mean, in terms of Europe, you know, uh, we have Finland, Sweden, UK clearly out there at be being best at linking data. I mean, Belgium, Denmark, France, Netherlands also doing pretty well. At the other end of the scale, Germany and Poland, obviously for very, very different reasons. And this does then link us towards the sort of issues about why there might be um, problems in using, I mean, it says big data strategy there, it's much more, it's a data strategy, use of data in governance of the system. Obviously, in the case of, of Germany, we are talking about data privacy being an absolutely overwhelming issue there. And I think, I don't know if we, this is the moment to start talking about data privacy, but for sure, I do, mm. I do think that what we have, I, I, I don't think that Finland and Sweden are throwing their data around and not using it in a, in a privacy sensitive way. I think they've shown that you can use data in a privacy sensitive way. What I find difficult to understand is at the other end of the scale, the countries that take such a narrow view of what data privacy involves do not learn, if you like, from the experience of those countries that have found a way to have privacy sensitive use of data. I think this is an area where we really have almost got lodged in particular silos of what we think. So we might even have the same legislation in terms of the EU, but the interpretation that then happens at the, the uh, individual country level is so very, very different because people have very, very different views of how the legislation should be interpreted. And I think this is an area, it's, so it's not so much the regulations, the legislation that I think that matters here. It is simply learning from the practice about how you can have, you know, how you anonymize the data, how you make sure the access to data is given to people who are, you know, reliable, how you monitor how they use the data. Those sorts of the issues are where we moved, need to be moving in rather than focusing so much on the regulations themselves. Excellent. Very, very important point. So I will go back to you, colleagues. So these fears of our data privacy seem to be overblown, and I think our speakers seem to agree on that point. And again, saying the data is there is about how we link it together. I have some points. I'll start with you because you had the point earlier. Could you take the microphone over there, please? Yeah. And I'll ask you now to be very disciplined in the way I haven't been disciplined, so no more than 30 seconds contributions, either contribution or very specific question. Over there. So my address is to Zoltan. Do you have many friends in the oncology community? You already have data. We've got many years of work we can already do with the data we have to improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. So for example, high-tech radiotherapy, the only randomized trial done was done in London. The Canadians have done a randomized trial to show you can get the same effect by giving radiotherapy in the morning, not the afternoon. Costs nothing. Um, we know that uh, breast, breast cancer chemotherapy saves lives, but if you don't give 85% of the intended dose, all the benefit goes, the patient gets the side effect. To, to make that happen, you need white cell growth factors. In America, the average prescription of them is five days, not seven, which is insufficient, and they would only do that for costs. His organization could sell them the drug at half the price. There are so many things we could do now. Washing your hands cuts down hospital infections, dramatically in ITU, but it's not done. So we've got five years' worth of action to catch up on before we need new data. So we'd appeal for that. A pragmatic approach to it. And yes, if you have a friend, others? I'll give you my email and help you out. <laughs> Short contributions, please, to the point. I want to hear about privacy issues. I want to hear about linkage. I want to hear about quality as well, because that's the key issues that we need to resolve in using this data. Over here, please. If you could move around as well, so we are faster in giving microphones. Um, yes, where shall I start? You asked us to do a reflection from the patient view. And a short one. Okay, 30 minutes. I'll take the 30 minutes version then. I, first of all, I love big data. I love internet, internet and I love e-health. Like all patients. Yeah, we do. <laughs> but uh, I, must, uh, I can start with when you're saying the best in the class is Sweden and Finland. And I must say, <laughs> I'm a Swede. And, and in Sweden, if we are the best in the class, then I really start to get worried. Because we are so siloed, we are so divided, the data. So the, so the uh, big data make use of that in Sweden. We are far, far, far from doing it. And that is one of the problems. The reason is, and that is the owner doesn't put the foot down and say, now we should have one system 
that is matching and communicating with each other. Then they leave it to the 21 region, and that is the same in other countries as well. I'm talking about the politician. I don't know if we have anyone here left in the room, but they, they have to, the owner of the system has to put the foot down so we can make use of it. On another hand, when it comes to we, the expectation, we need to be also changed a little bit, to be a little more realistic. What can we make use of big data? We heard a discussion at the IMI a couple of weeks ago that we think that every gun, the, the tomorrow going to be blue sky and shiny and everything is going to be great if we have big data because then we're going to make use of it. And as we heard earlier here, we already have knowledge to change so many things and we don't do it. And then it's coming back also to lick, we need to identify what is the bottlenecks to make use of it. And then we come down to what do I need to make a change in my life? It has to come from within. I have to understand it and I have to make use of it. Another thing that I'm worried about, and that is responsibility as Adrian pick up. And you said, okay, we blame the industry, but the industry has good lawyers, so maybe we tend pour it down to the patient, and they, we are blaming the patient that don't to pro, 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 do the right adherence or take the drug rightly. But I must remember, we are still legal to be stupid. It's still legal to make wrong decision. So we need to bring that in as well, in, in the blame and shame, so we don't have a stigmatization in this. Then that will stop it all, all the thing that. Safety, data, the data is my data, and that we need. We are not against big data from the patient we are. We are not against to make use of this, but we say the bottom line is that my data is my data. So I need to, this is not something that the government owns. It is my, and we have to have that link and that dialogue in that. We had that in the... Uh, Health High Level Task Force for eHealth a couple of years ago, and we come up with some great suggestions, and, and uh, we, we go for that. Thank you. I have a point over here and another one there, so I'll start with Richard. And if you could give the microphone to the gentleman there, please. Uh -huh. ready? Yes, so, yes, so um, this is back to the, you know, if you fail to deliver on the outcomes, who is uh, liable for that, or who, who, who won't get paid, and Adrian, put your, you put the finger on this earlier on. The whole idea behind the IMI program that uh, Elizabeth mentioned is actually to work on this. It's uh, so my, my, my president, uh, George Jimenez from Novartis, he said the other day at the, our annual meeting that there's a suite of services that will have to be coordinated. Okay? So it's about aligning all those incentives. It's about the nurses that are involved, the doctors that are involved, whoever is involved. So the idea in the pro this program is that we will take a couple of products, uh, or groups of products that are in, in late stage development or on the market, we would ag find a way to agree what are the relevant outcomes. The regulators may have one view together with us. Payers, health systems may have other ideas about the outcomes. So we should have an, we should have a, an agreement on that. And then, then once you have that, you say, where's the data to then verify to follow up on these outcomes? If we don't have the data available somewhere in the system, we, we need to create some kind of met method to collect this data. And then once you have that information, you take it, you ana analyze the different incentives. You know, wh why didn't we achieve these outcomes despite having some good medicines? You know, then there's something else wrong in the system. And take this all the way down, and as we do so, figure out you know, how we're actually going to align all the, all the incentives and the payments that go with them. Right? So we are very much aware of this, and of course, we, you could see a business model in which the industry would be providing the integrated services, or at least what we would do is that we would, we would hire those people. You could potentially could have contracting contracts with service providers that when, when we were experts in developing medicines, we're not experts in delivering healthcare, but there are other people that are very good at delivering healthcare, and they could be, for instance, even hired by the industry to, 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 to carry out you know, the agreed uh, uh, plan to, to deliver on outcomes. So this IMI program is really interesting, and, and I mm -hmm. encourage all of you to follow that and also take part once it starts. Thank you, Richard. I got another point there. I'll ask you colleagues to try to memorize all these points, and I'll give you two or three minutes at the end to wrap up after we vote, to reflect particularly on those issues of implementation. And particularly, I'd like to hear more from you 
as well about the integration of this big data into the health system, the incentives issues, organizational issues. Some here have been blaming the politicians, as always. So, I mean, is it about the political culture that we're not using the, the big data a bit more? So I'd like you to perhaps to prepare some more ref reflection on this area. I had a point there, another one over there, John Kakia. But first here, you wanted to speak? Harry, Emmy, Harry Hemingway, Far Institute, UK. A question for Mark, given the <coughs> emphasis that you put on record linkages, uh, to what extent do you think having better metrics of the extent to which countries are linking their data would be a useful comparative and actionable insight? Thank you. John Kakia? Um, can, I, can I ask a provocative question to Please. the panel? How are we going to get the results of all this big data to the most essential link within the system. And this gets me back to the health system applications. To the professional patient interface, where the people who cannot use the technologies, who people who are too vulnerable or too illiterate to use technologies, can also benefit from this. Because in the traditional sense of the word, convoys are as fast as their slowest moving ship. And we have to take care of these vulnerable people who risk being left out of all of this unless, at the professional level, we create the right environment within which, at that interface, these, these vulnerable people can benefit from all this beautiful big data analysis. And I think, and this is an appeal to the Commission and to whoever is uh, governing all of these processes, that these are tangible deliverables that should be included in such projects, i.e., how do we tag this information, this finding, to this interface? Thank you very much. Very important. We haven't talked about one of the objectives, which was accessibility and patient empowerment and the impact that these big data, these apps may have on some of the lower social classes, some of the less privileged groups. Do I have any more points on that? Safety integration within the health systems? Can't believe that. You're happy about the way... Please, Kaisa. Maybe you may want to talk about literacy, an area that uh, there's been a lot of initiatives as well at the European level. Well, actually, um, yes. I mean, Kaisa Imon and Carol Lambos from European Patients Forum. I didn't want to speak about big data, but I did want to make a couple of points about technology generally and its relationship to patient empowerment. Um, and... The point I want to make is that technology in itself is not empowering. It's when it provides a solution to a problem that you have. So I think one of the biggest problems with technology and e-health and m-health apps and so on at the moment is that they are driven by technology interests and by commercial interests and not really by patient needs. And that's why we get a lot of technology kit that is essentially um, a solution in search of a problem. And what really needs to happen is that the whole process needs to be turned yes. around. And people need to ask patients first, what is your problem? What do you need a solution for? And then provide that solution. And the second point I wanted to make is that for patients' empowerment perspective and health literacy perspective as well, it all starts from access to your own health information. And this is not a reality for many patients across the EU at the moment. And this is a really, really big problem. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to vote before we ask uh, our panelists to reflect uh, on all these comments. But I'm going to be cheating a bit. So could you put the voting, please? But I'm going to bypass one, two, and three, because we talked about that, and four as well. So we go to five and six, please. So let's vote on five. You remember, I strongly disagree. One, I strongly agree. Five. So could you go to the fifth question, please? Go on. Does the system allow us to go through? No, no. I, I want to go to the fifth question. Is it possible? There you are with technology. <laughs> so, you know, the technology is not to support me as a moderator to go to the fifth question, but we need to... Technology finds solutions as well. I want to do the fifth and sixth because we'll complement very much the debate we're having today. Fifth would be better. Perfect. So fifth question, because we haven't talked about that. Adopt an approach to public health 
that utilizes the latest knowledge in genomics, genomics and public health, I find that a very interesting area, by the way, respecting data protection and identifying appropriate and ethical ways of preventing unnecessary costs to the system in health and economic terms. Okay? So public health, genomics, and so on. So vote whether you agree with this statement or disagree. One to five, disagree one, agree strongly five. Pom, pom, pom. Okay. Oops. Okay, interesting. There's mostly an agreement, but not a strongly agreement. So I'm interested particularly on one and two, why they don't agree about that. And perhaps, Mark, later on, you want to put that into your... Uh, or any of you, I'd like to hear you talking about or reflecting a bit on this idea of genomics and public health, whether there's... We need to move from population-based public health to more genomics-based public health and direct screening much more to those uh, people that have the, the, the wrong, oh, that's the wrong word, but the, 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 the more risk genes, let's put it that way. So think about that, please, on your on final comments. Question number six, please. Okay, this is important, uh, Petris. I'll, I'll ask you to tell us a bit more about that and perhaps as well from Andre. Harness European structural investment funds to develop IT infrastructures that promote prevention promotion, patient self-monitoring, and service delivery reforms. Patrice, can we use this, these funds to develop these, these big data, these initiatives? Do you agree or disagree? Okay. Easy to vote, actually. So, most people, still people that would disagree. I don't understand the disagreements in some of these areas, but maybe it's because it's not possible. Petrus, is that possible? Uh, will you? It isn't possibly. I mean, Andre can even give more detail, but I mean, for health Could and e-health, it's very definitely possible to use the regional financing, and this is obviously in communication with the member states, but this is how to say more Andre's field than mine, so I'm very happy to uh, pass the question to him. Uh, it's, it's true that uh, in, in most of uh, member states, you know, they decided to use structure funds for e-health. This was one of the priorities area we, we discussed, so, so there are money there. Uh, of course, the big question is you know, how you can employ this money. And, and you know, it's, uh, as, as Mark said, this is not just you know, uh, do things, but how and, and when. And do you have enough knowledge and capacity to, 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 to make the, the, the system uh, work? So many countries decided, it. many regions are investing in this field. So if we are lucky in next 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 years, we have will have infrastructure, but also the also big investment in the IT infrastructure as such. I mean, uh, so this is something also Commission is promoting, you know, as a big telecommunication exercise across Europe. So we will have infrastructure. We most probably will have uh, money there, but of course there are people knowledge and everything rest is needed to be to be employed. Indeed. And and very much sort of the final reflections which should be perhaps on those additional health systems issues to actually integrate the big data. So let's have our final remarks. Lisa, do you want to start? Yes, I would like to start and I would like to come back to the political culture because I was very interested by, by what Mark earlier said about the fact that at political level, a lot of times opinions and decisions are rather based on expert opinions than on data. And therefore, I was looking back, and it's perhaps an illustration as, as the last uh, contribution for, from our side, because I used to work as a politi political advisor in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is already mentioned in, in also your example. And it's a lot of times at European uh, level considered as quite an interesting system because it's a private system, it really tries to focus on quality. But back then in 2008, when we were in the midst of the crisis, discussing with the finance minister, also the, the long term and, and the short term uh, budget cuts that were needed, we tried to make that shift already from volume and transactions to the longer term approach of, of uh, outcome and then the focus on outcomes. And it was very interesting just in order to illustrate this, this political shift that is still needed, I think, in a lot of European countries, 
that then after we tried to illustrate this and we, we tried to also use the data we had then back in 2008, the finance minister looked at us, at our team, and he was like, I admit that, that you're right, but I'm not going to admit it, it publicly. <laughs> and this is an anecdote, but I think it's a good illustration because in the Netherlands, I think back then, I think we made a lot of, uh, the Netherlands made a lot of progress, but perhaps in a lot of European member states, they're still in a political decision and it's still a challenge between the health ministers and the finance ministers. So I think that's, that will be my closing remark because that's still something we need to work on. Very appropriate, political shift. But Zoltan, I mean, some of these things, we don't need big data to improve. The knowledge is already there, it's been said by, by some colleagues here. Uh, it's fantastic. The knowledge and intervention is there, but the knowledge and diagnosis is not there. So the problem is that uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, solutions uh, from, from um, uh, other countries, and it's, it's good to have those uh, solutions. Uh, but uh, whether this is a problem in our countries, uh, we don't know. That's the reason why I think we need to have a prior knowledge uh, before making interventions and then uh, uh, exposed uh, knowledge uh, to, to monitor uh, uh, the impact of, of, of intervention. And that's why in our countries we need uh, to use uh, data uh, more uh, appropriately. Um, uh, the, the, the second point I, I, I would like to make, which is uh, very important, that, that obviously uh, we need an IT infrastructure uh, and, and that requires a huge investment, but, but I see uh, more problem uh, from uh, the legal framework and not even from uh, you know, having the right regulation, but the misinterpretation, uh, so, the, so the use of, of, of that regulation. Uh, and, and for example, in my country, this uh, prevents uh, uh, the use of, of, of uh, big data. In my personal opinion, it's just a misinterpretation of the, of the current uh, legal framework. Uh, the, the last point is that about uh, uh, literacy of, of patients. Uh, and and um, so, so uh, this, is, um, this reminds me uh, about uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the last uh, or two centuries ago, the steam engine that uh, everyone believed that this is a big thing and then, then uh, 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 but, 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 but in fact um, uh, uh, it's driven by, by individuals, by, by people uh, and then, then uh, uh, obviously the more educated uh, will be a little bit more advanced and, and finally uh, the, the lower socioeconomic uh, uh, class people will be a little bit uh, disadvantaged but, but uh, that shouldn't prevent us uh, from, from uh, making the best use of, 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 of these uh, uh, notions. So uh, uh, obviously I, I, I um, have more concerns about the illiteracy of politicians on this issue than the illiteracy of, of uh, individual patients and, and we have to improve uh, uh, both. So more abuse to the politicians today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should not uh, stop the steam engine, John. We want the steam engine to keep pushing so hopefully the others will, will catch up as well. But we need to do a bit push some of the wagons at the end as well. Petris. Well, thank you very much, Josep. I mean, I think I would like to underline a holistic, citizen-centered approach to access to data and to data protection. As Anders mentioned, the eHealth Task Force, chaired by President Ilvis uh, a few years ago working with us, said, my data, my decision. And really, I think that this is positive in the new proposed data protection regulation that health data is now a separate category of sensitive data. Because what is important about health data is that generally the patient, the citizen, wants it to circulate freely for his or her treatment, for the prevention of disease, for biomedical research in the future, but probably doesn't want it to go anywhere. But again, they can also share it, share it themselves. Um, for us, the inclusion of the vulnerable citizens is absolutely essential. As I mentioned, and there's a lot of good practice out there, digital has to come to the citizen, not uh, the citizen coming to digital. So we can't expect everyone to buy a smartphone, broadband, and so on. We have to look for ways to deliver the public services. This is essential. And um, just to say, it's, I can mention it because it's open access. Anybody who wants to hear more from me on this, um, I have a University of Oxford uh, working paper that I co-authored uh, called From Spectators to Change Agents, Empowering EU Citizens as Drivers of eHealth Innovation. 
where I describe a little bit further thinking on really putting the citizen, the patient, and the consumer, because I look at them in, in different ways, at the center of the design of the way that we can roll out these policies and really gain the maximum benefit, because it can only be done with this kind of orientation. Indeed. That's excellent concluding remarks. Mark. Um, first of all, there was a question uh, from Harry about whether I thought that collecting metrics on data linkage was a good idea. Way, and I do indeed. I think you know the numbers that I showed were very, very crude numbers. I think the uh, the idea of collecting actual real data on how many times we managed to link data would be a way of almost normalizing getting countries to actually understand that other countries manage to do this, other areas manage to do this more often. That's something I would love to be able to do. Uh, more generally, I was trying to think of a way to, to stand back a little bit from where we are uh, to answer some of the other questions that have been raised. I mean, one thing that's clearly going on in the economy more generally is digitization is taking over and the world of work is changing. So as you probably have noticed, the number of accountants in our economies has halved in the past 15 years. Other professions also gradually being wiped out uh, by better use of the data that's available. And I think this will hit health. It hasn't really hit health yet. But if you look at areas like finance, your bank manager in the past used to do a diagnosis of your financial health and decide whether he was going to lend money to you. There is no reason why that can't become a bigger part and indeed almost certainly will become a big, bigger part of our health systems. And I don't think it has happened yet, partly for inertia reasons, partly because of the power, actually, of the, the healthcare professional, uh, professionals, the doctors and the nurses, which have, to some extent, resisted that. But looking into the future, I think it's, we, we do already see it in some areas. We see a decline in the number of radiologists in many countries. I think it's difficult to imagine that, coming back to the question that was asked about how do we get data, big data, into the patient-clinician interface, face, that that will be the direction that we will go in because it's happened everywhere else in the economy, that it will become much more a data-driven interface. And almost certainly that will mean a change in the role of physicians and to some extent nurses, although less so. And I think that health systems really do need to start planning for that, whether they have the right mix of healthcare professionals for, say, 20 years' time. Because at the moment you'd have to say health is 15 years behind the rest of the economy in the way that dig digital economy is integrated into the, the healthcare system. I can't see that being sustainable as time goes on. Mm -hmm. That's extremely useful. Uh, indeed, uh, when you compare the healthcare industry with other industries, we are the industry that uses less information systems and less digital platforms. And it reminds me of a conference, e health conference that Connect was organizing for the Danish presidency, which we, I was speaking a platform with the high official of the Ministry of Finance of, of Denmark. And he was saying that uh, he actually knew exactly what everyone had to pay and no one escaped. No one escaped for paying taxes in Denmark. He had all the data and he was using it very effectively. I'm not sure that applies directly to health, is that why we won? But certainly there's a lot of potential there. But we heard as well about some of the pitfalls and the things we should be careful about. I'd like to thank very much our wonderful panelists. Thank you for being so disciplined, to addressing all the questions, and thank you to you for holding 10 more minutes, but we started a bit late as well, and have a nice coffee. Thank you very much. I'm very puzzled about this.